Listen, the primary reason that I started doing the study in the book of Revelation is because I've really not seen in my lifetime so many people um, that are really way off when it comes to end time prophecy, when it comes to the, the book of Revelation. And I want to just quantitate for everybody the reality that we're not even, we're, we're, there's a lot of bad things going on, but there's no way we're not, we're not there. And so at the very beginning, and if you look back at the YouTubes, you're going to see this. I just started right in at uh, Revelation uh, chapter 6, really, just so that everybody could begin to value and quantitate the, the series of uh, cataclysmic events that begin to take place at the very first day, uh, as it were, of the, of, of the tribulation, showing even in a timeline that within just several months, I mean, there is such series of events that have taken place that the, literally the geography of the earth has changed. So all of this hoopla that's going on that we're already in the tribulation, all it's doing is leading people down a garden path that's going to ultimately end in, in falling off the cliff. Because if you think that you're in a predictable zone and you've been convinced that, you know, these things are true and that you're here in the middle of the tribulation and there's just a few more years or whatever and it's all going to be over and Jesus is going to come and that's how you came into the kingdom and that is the basis of truth for you, well, you're going to be sadly disappointed and then you're going to throw the whole thing away because you were convinced that a lie is truth and now through that dis being disheartened, you're ultimately going to become shipwrecked. I don't want people to come become shipwrecked. I want people to know where they're at on the timeline of prophecy. I know where I'm at on the timeline of prophecy. I can show you where I'm at on the timeline of prophecy. I am in the last days before the tribulation. I'm in the last day before the events that the book of Revelation describe beginning in Revelation chapter 4 take place. Okay? Is everybody with me? Okay, good. Now, what I'm afraid of is that most folks don't even have a general overview of things. They don't even know where they're at on the map biblically. Uh, and so I, I, I want to help emphasize the point that what I'm ministering about here is really just an overview. It's just a general overview. And, and you're going to have to apply yourself. It, it's going to be a little bit more than just saying, I know the Lord Jesus and I love him and he loves me. It's going to go down to the point of actually following him, obeying him and being interested in what he's interested in. Because father's got a different... Uh, Mindset, a different um, a purpose, uh, things are, that uh, are important to him, by and large, uh, many people don't have any time for. So let's go ahead and be a part of those things that are important to the Lord. So tonight, I'm going to begin to take you into maybe what you might think of as a little bit more detail, but it's still just a general overview. I'm going to help you understand where all of the rebellion began and where all the rebellion is going to end. I want to help you understand tonight that literally Satan governs this world. He governs the kingdoms of this world. He works his craft through the agency of the kingdoms of this world. And if people could begin to even grasp this, they would understand Satan does by and large govern the monetary system. Satan does by and large govern the academic system. Satan by and large uh, governs the social system, the governmental realms of men. And I'm going to prove that to you tonight. And if I can help you understand this, I believe you will have a different disposition about the way that you interface with this, the way that you come under the influences of humanism and popular opinion. Just find out what popular opinion is and you got the mind of Satan. And, and, and do the opposite and you're probably going to be in the right spot, okay? So I'm going to try to mesh together for you um, the things that God revealed to Nebuchadnezzar through Daniel 
in, in Daniel chapter 2. I'm going to grab a hold of some of the symbolism of Revelation chapter 12 for you tonight. And Revelation chapter 17. I'm going to leave out a lot of other detailed symbolism that is in the book of Daniel that would help us understand this even more thoroughly. And I'm going to give you hints and I'm going to give you starting points to be able to learn this in a much more detailed way. Let me see this book because I just want to recommend this book. I highly recommend this book. It's Revelation Expounded. I memorized it for the first time probably when I was 17 years old. Um, I knew most of it before I memorized the book. Um, I literally, I could quote the book. And I could still, you know, quote, well, I could... I, I can quote most of the book even now. But the, the bottom line of it is, I believe that when you're stirred by God to know these things, you're going to do whatever it takes to learn them. And they become the most important things to you in your life. And, and I, I pray that people, parents, will make these things the most important issues, subjects to their children. Because then as they grow, then they are those who are now developed and are able to teach others also. And God the Holy Ghost works right in the big middle of this kind of hunger. God the Holy Ghost works right in the big middle of us really being interested in what Father's interested in. And so, you know, when we look at the, 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 the gigantic earth, okay, uh, you know, which is somewhat of a small place when it's compared to the rest of the universe, but this is where it's all happening. And, um, you know, I really would, I've said it many times, I would really like for people to be able to venture out into the infinite expand of space and recognize that it's all empty out there. It really is. Father's doing it all right here. And they can look all they want for life, but, it, you know, they're not going to find it in the, in, within the, the parameters of what their instruments can detect. Um, I was with a, a guy from NASA the other day, and I said, how far are we actually, he is actually a part of the team that did the Hubble telescope. I said, how far are we actually from being able to see the, the moment of the event? How far are we at, um, uh, from being able to look out and see the outer envelope of the Big Bang? He said, you know, he felt was within five years. I said, I want you to understand, uh, you heard it here first. When you finally get the photomultiplier tube that sensitive, it's not, it's not going to be there. It's going to be further still because creation expresses the very nature of God. It's as infinite and as expansive as he himself is. And so, um, you know, I just want to say that in, in view of just looking at this small little, uh, you know, scope of things within the framework of God's infiniteness. And um, here we are now uh, re really, by and large, looking at the Bible's story and history and the governments and the events of the governments that affect the world and where all the world's eyes were centered at the beginning and where all the world's eyes will be centered at the end is right here in this little section. This is it right here in this little section. And I can tell you about some dynamics that have gone down. I think that that uh, right there, isn't that something? Isn't that really small? Huh? Isn't that really very, very small? Um, I, and, and right now, all the world's eyes are wondering at this area, at, at, even at this point in time. And, and you say, well, why is everybody so interested in that right over there? The oil. <laughs> why, are we care, why do we care about ISIL? Because there's similar things happening elsewhere. I know that they've done more public things uh, and because we made them more public. But you know what? Um, reporters have been killed in other parts of the earth and, and Sudan and other places. are not quite so interesting because they don't have as much of that black stuff. And so the oil has ultimately captivated people's uh, attention. But you know what? The reality of it is, Father ultimately has a bigger plan going on, and he, he already described that this was ultimately going to end up this way. It was about right there that it all began um, within this uh, world that we now um, inhabit. Uh, th there was a flood that, that uh, destroyed the cosmos, and that flood uh, that destroyed the cosmos is talked about in several verses of scripture, and uh, one in uh, Genesis chapter uh, one, uh, and uh, uh, verse um, chapter one and uh, verse two, and uh, also in the Psalms, and also in, in Jeremiah, and and a few other minor prophets describe a, a flood that destroyed the cosmos, and then there's a flood that 
that uh, destroyed everything that, that had within it the breath of life. That was Noah's flood. And uh, right after that, there came a guy who was the son of Cush. His name was Nimrod. And right here, Nimrod raised up a kingdom. He was a mighty hunter of men. And he, he thought to build to himself under the influences of demon spirits. And I'm going to show you that as we read Revelation chapter 17. I'm going to show you. You, you, say, you think, well, how did uh, th these great kings like Alexander the Great, how did they get to be so great? How did they get so much charisma? How did they have so much impact on humanity? There was literally an angel of darkness, not just a demon spirit. We're not talking about people demon possessed. We're talking about an angel of darkness giving them power, giving them ability. An angel can't get inside of you. A demon can. Demons are disembodied spirits. Literally, I, and, and the book of Revelation shows us the activities of demon spirits, but the uh, book of Revelation also shows us the activity of angels of darkness. So I'm going to give you some of that tonight. We're just trying to give you a little bit of overview before, I, uh, before we kind of step in this. But it was right in here that um, Nimrod... Uh, gathered together the people of the earth and uh, began to rule over all of humanity. And he was a mighty hunter and people think he was going out hunting deer, an elephant, and the, the big five. He was not. He was a hunter of men. He made slaves out of men so that he could ultimately accomplish his demonic goal. And that was that all, all men would, would worship him because uh, Satan wants all men to worship uh, him. And, and Satan has purpose that he will ultimately bring everybody to a point where he will mark them as his slaves. They will fall down and they will uh, declare him to be God. And that's where this whole thing is going. And so you can, we can remember with Nimrod um, that, uh, you know, the scripture says that they were building a tower, a ziggurat. A, uh, it, but they were doing more than building a tower because the Hebrew language makes it a gate or an entryway. They were building an entryway. They, it was a place of worship. It was a, it was a temple. And they said that they might reach into the heavens, okay? And people, you know, when we were little guys and in Sunday school class, you know, we were building the little Tower of Bible. We were building the little ziggurat, you know. And we had them going up into the clouds. And they were going to go all the way to heaven. Well, that's absolutely ridiculous, okay, because we know they're going to pass out at about, what, 20,000 feet? They're pretty much dead, right? Or, or something like that. They're really, they're needing oxygen at any rate, right? By 40,000 feet, they are dead, correct? Is everybody with me? So the Lord didn't say, don't worry about it. They're going to get to 40,000, or they're going to get to 25,000 feet and pass out. He didn't say that. He said that there is nothing that would be... Um, uh, there would be no limitations or nothing withheld from them if they are allowed to continue doing what they were doing. And it was all about this interaction of the spiritual world uh, of men interfacing with the realms of darkness, even in a greater level of submission. Everybody is under the influence of the God of this world to some degree. Except for God's people who are born of the Spirit, they've been translated out of darkness into the light. Now, you know, to walk in the presence of, of the light of His countenance will, will ultimately result that you don't want any fellowship uh, with darkness. And this has been a big challenge for the churchmen, for the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, for the elders and leaders of the church to ultimately help people come to realize how good it is to be with God. A big part of that is people only know religion. They don't really know His presence. They don't really know the manifest presence. And so ultimately, what, what are you going to do when you don't know the manifest presence? It's, you know, you're going to be pretty empty on the inside. But bottom line of it is all men are under the prince and the power of the air, the God of this world, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. But then there is another level, and it's a level where people begin to voluntarily invite demon spirits to come into their life. They begin to voluntarily worship Satan. They want to interact with angels of darkness. That went on with Nimrod, and it goes on today. And it ultimately will see the rise of it as time goes on. And today... Uh, such things have become more popular than ever before. And so I, I want to grab a hold of you. You know what? If I could help, if I would spend a day with you, 24 hours with you, and you would allow me, I would show you 
well, it might take more than 24 hours because you might be able to act really good for 24 hours. See, <clears throat> I might, if I could spend a week for you, get past the show and get past the act, and then we could actually start getting into the details of what's going on in your life, what you're allowing, what you're allowing to work in your imaginations, what you're allowing to work in your feelings and your thinking. I could begin to point out to you areas where you are submitting yourself to the influences of the God of this world. And, it, and people need to understand that, that that is the first cut of discernment. That is more important than anything else, where we recognize where we're allowing evil spirits to begin to influence the way we think, the way we behave, our attitudes. The first stronghold is the imagination. That's where the power of God is directed for, uh, towards us. The second level, of course, is the realm of self, understanding how to deny yourself, because that is the realm in which a lot of things can begin to interplay. Most people can't recognize their self. Why? Because they have justified all their behavior as good and common and ordinary and you know those are those are things that we get insight and wisdom to because we want to walk with God because we pay attention to the word we understand that lowliness and meekness is absolute loving kindness and tender mercies is absolute and then when we give ourselves to that we begin to discover all the things that are keeping us from doing that Aha! Why don't you pay a little bit more attention to that and decide you're not going to have it in your life? Because then you've really begin to engage against this conflict that, that, we're, that we're up against. You really begin to engage into another level of wanting to do the will of the Father instead of your own will. And so I, I try to make the dynamics of what's going on in the satanic world as, as, as clearly defined as I possibly can and help you understand in, a, in, in as most practical way really uh, how you may be being influenced by these things, but the Lord has given us power to tread upon scorpions and serpents and over all the power of the enemy. He's given us authority to cast out devils. And it's about time we take it up. And somebody said, I tried to cast out a devil. Why couldn't I? Because you've been playing around too much with the devil. That's why you didn't have an authority. Yeah. And, um, you know, you're just going to, but go ahead and engage because it's going to cause you, a con, it's going to work a consecration in your life. You're going to say, wait a minute, why hasn't this power affected in my life? And then you're going to have to start dealing with subtle influences. And, you know, I was telling someone today, my mom told me about the three big preacher killers. She didn't tell me about the fourth one. And the fourth one was the biggest one of all, and it's the most subtle. My mom told me about how that the three preacher killers are pride, money, and women. But she didn't tell me about discouragement, and that comes as the most subtle of all. And it's the one that's taken more preachers out than anyone else. And it's the one also that every one of God's people, all believers, have to deal with. Yet they've not been able to understand it and define it as demonic. Encouragement comes from the Holy Ghost. He's the encourager. He's always saying, we can do this. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. He's the encourager. Get up. Stop doing that. Let's go. You know, his rebukes are encouragement, you know. So, I mean, the thing about it, you've got to understand that. That when you begin to recognize, wait a minute, discouragement, come under that discouragement. That's the prince of power of the air. And if you would begin to deal with it, you would then begin to be more effective with understanding of how to walk in the spirit and live by the spirit. And that discouragement always accesses us through some realm of self-interest. Because, we, you know, it's a performance phase. How are we doing? You know, there was only three people in my meeting tonight. You know, I must really be not very anointed. I know some very anointed people who only had 12 people in their meetings most of the time, beginning with Jesus. Um, and I know some incredible anointed people that only had like one guy. Elijah. And I could go on and on, you know. So, uh, you know, we've got to make sure that our definition of what success is that which is defined for us by the will of the Father. And the will of the Father is defined for us simply in us being raptured in relationship with Him and knowing that everything works together for good and that we're right in the center of His will and plan. And now, man, you've got an ability to say no to everything that would come out to discourage you. Yeah. And then, you know, when you're walking like that, you just do a little boo-hoo. Uh, I just boo-hooed a little bit last night uh, because some diesel got in my DEF fluid on, on my new truck. And so I took it to the, the auto mechanics and they said, it's, did I, um, uh, you know, I ruined the whole thing and uh, that uh, the warranty is, is um, not valid and effective because I'm an idiot, <laughs> basically. And so I talked to everybody I could possibly talk to and said, no, 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 this bottom line is going to cost you about 3000 bucks to get this thing fixed. And, and then I discovered that my car's not supposed to be working. And by the way, I 
uh, gone to Oregon and back and all over the place since this happened. But nonetheless, you know, no one's going to understand that, right? Uh, because I said, well, can I drive my truck? Well, you can't drive your truck. It won't work. Oh, it won't work. Okay, I just come off of a, like a thousand mile trip, but the, uh, two thousand mile trip. But that's the way the Lord is. So I, I, and they tell me there's no way we're not paying for this. And so I just said, Father, I don't like this. I don't like this. Don't let them rip me off. This first thing in the morning, they call me up. Uh, uh, Mr. Spitzbergen, I always want to let you know that we're going to give this one to you. And uh, so why? My papa's going to take good care of me. He's just, he's, and what, you know, what we want to do is we want to, I don't let that lead the way. That follows, okay? I don't let proof of that I've got relationship lead the way. I'm in the center of his will and plan. His love's been accepted and embraced by me. I'm, I'm doing these things that God's given me to do. And, and that's just, you know, it's not about, it's not motivated by he's going to answer my prayer. God, get me out of this and I'll do anything for you kind of thing. Are you with me? Yeah. And so we want everybody to get over here into this place of walking in the light where these, these things of God are such a joy to you. But the word of God, understanding what's going on right now. And there's nobody that needs to walk in darkness. Okay, and that's what these meetings are about. I want you to understand really what's happening in the timeline of, uh, of the Father. I want you to be able to no longer be ignorant to Satan's devices. I know exactly what he wants. He wants to be worshipped. He wants in er he wants everybody to say no to God. He wants everybody to blame and accuse God, and he wants everybody to turn to him and worship him so he can destroy them eternally in hell. What plan? Okay. So, I, I want you. I want to feature this thing for you real quickly, um, and and uh, do I want to read Revelation chapter seventeen for you first? I think I want to read. I think I want to read Revelation chapter seventeen to you first. And um, anybody got a Bible that I can see? Yeah, one that's not uh, six font. I would like to have at least 12. The lighting's not so good. Uh, let's start in Revelation chapter 12. Let me let you look at an obscure picture that shouldn't be obscure to you. Um, and and the, I, I want this to become very familiar to you. Satan was not first identified as a, a dragon um, uh, or a serpent. Um, in the book of Revelation, he was identified as a dragon and a serpent uh, long ago. And um, uh, when Israel came up out of Egypt in Exodus, uh, referred to again in um, Psalms, uh, well, referred to again in Job, and then also again in the Psalms. But I want you to look at this. And, and this is the enemy of the plan of what God is doing. Okay, so God brings forth the man-child um, through the woman. And we're talking about Israel and the man-child being the 144,000. I'm not writing anything in here. I'm just telling you. I read the book. I know what the interpretation of it is. It, the Lord didn't leave us guessing. Chapter 14 gave us the chapter 7 of Revelation gave us the introduction. Chapter 12 gave us the conflict, and chapter 14 gave us the full understanding of who uh, the 144,000 is. Okay, are you with me? I want to say that again. <clears throat> chapter 7 gave us the introduction to the man child, the 144,000, those that God uses as evangelists for the nation of Israel because we're dealing with Jacob's sorrow here. We're dealing with the 70 weeks determined upon Israel, okay, which I went through last time. Just so simply go back, review the YouTube, and you'll understand that the Lord laid out a whole course of events that really defined up to the very 69th week was when the Messiah was cut off. Okay, these are weeks of seven. It was the very day that the Messiah was cut off or crucified almost 2,000 years ago. There's been a gap between the 69th week and the 70th week that has lasted almost 2,000 years. The 70th week once again turns back to do and to focus on what the first 69 weeks focused on, which was the nation of Israel and God's dealing with the nation of Israel, okay? Um, the book of Revelation, once again, is the pouring out of God's wrath upon all men because of sin and iniquity. If there's anything that people can walk away from understanding about the book of Revelation is the fact that God's judgment and wrath and indignation on a level that is unimaginable is directed towards sin and iniquity. That's how God feels about sin and iniquity. If somebody's mistaken about how God feels about sin and iniquity, read the book of Revelation. Okay, so I really want to capture your attention 
And I see, I know that the Word of God, I know that as I preach the Word of God, those things that would try to pollute your mind, those things that would try to distract you, those things that would try to keep you from walking with God are broken off of you. That's why you need to be in church. That's why you need to be under the Word. That's why you need to learn how not to have distractions in your life. Listen, when you begin to read the Word, there's a lot of folks who, when they begin to read the Bible, they think about other things. You need to get a hold of yourself because something's not functioning properly in your spirit. You need to slow down and get interested in the Word of God. There is an interface going on in your life at that very moment that will cause you to understand a, a lot of your troubles. I, my job is to get people out of the fantasy, out of the fictional stuff, and into reality. And, and this, is a, uh, this is a job of work to do. And I just want you to get with me on these things. And if you will, you'll begin to walk in the spirit, the manifestation of the power of God and the effectiveness of the, of the working of God in your life. will just, will just, it will absolutely soar. So once again, the cha Revelation chapter 7 introduced the man child, the 144,000, 12,000 uh, Jews from the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, they're virtuous men, and some one, one time, woman one time told me she was one of the 144,000. I said, look, the 144,000 are men. They're virtuous men who've never known a woman. Sorry. Okay? And so chapter 14 is the one that actually breaks that down. So back to the whole contrast. Here we see the, uh, in, in the middle, we're now in the middle of, of, the, of the 70th week of Daniel's uh, prophecy and vision as the Lord made known to him the whole scope of things. Uh, that would take place before the Lord Jesus would come and set up before God, who is Christ Jesus, would come and set up his kingdom. And so here we are in the middle of that, uh, that week now. And we see now in the middle of that week, um, early on under the, uh, uh, what was it? Was it the fifth or sixth seal? The 144,000 show up. And then within about a year or time, they're going to ultimately be threatened to be destroyed by Satan. Satan wants to take them out because he's cast out of heaven and he comes down to earth with great wrath. Now, it really comes into the earth realm. Cast out of heaven, he's cast out of the unseen realm. Now men can see him, okay? And now this is a whole nother level of interaction. And, and so right here in Revelation chapter 12, we see the symbolism of him. And, one, and he's always being symbolized no matter where you read about him, he's being symbolized, and especially in Daniel and the book of Revelation, as he ultimately manifests himself through governmental powers, through nations, through governmental powers, okay? And so we're going to see this right off, and then I'm going to show it to you on a number, in a number of uh, other ways before I'm finished tonight. And then the next uh, study also is going to go into this just a little bit deeper. But here we see him. We see this dragon. He has seven heads and he has ten horns. And he has seven crowns upon those heads. Now what's going to happen in Revelation chapter 17, we're going to see the woman, the prostitute or the harlot, who's drunk upon the blood of the saints. She's also riding on a beast, which is showed different because it's a scarlet beast or a red beast. And this beast has actually the same symbolism. He has seven heads and he has ten horns. And, and then, of course, God breaks it down for us more clearly. And then knowing the book of Daniel, you have an exactness about what these governments are, who these governments are, when they existed. People want to say that Daniel wasn't written when it was written because Daniel's prophecies were so accurate that it could, it, 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 if you were to believe that Daniel, the book of Daniel was written during the time of Daniel, everybody would have to say, this man was a prophet and he told us everything that is going to happen on the earth in governmental events, in great sociological and, and, and um, economic events until the time that God comes and sets up his kingdom on the earth. And I'm going to be talking to you about that so you can grab it. And, and so um, I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 17 and I want you to get ready for some interpretation, okay? Because I'm going to let the Bible do the interpretation. So as, as I set you up in, the, in, in Revelation chapter 17, I want to take you back in time, okay? Uh, that's the future, and I'm going to take you back in time, and I'm just going to show you one little uh, uh, nibbit of, of what's going on and, and, and the effect of how that so much has taken place 
and so much will take place right here in this little area, okay? And so I'm going to put this up here. I, I don't know if you can see it very well. This is courtesy of uh, uh, Francesca. So here we are, okay? Um, uh, Daniel chapter 2. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and nobody can interpret the dream, okay? Uh, because he's not going to give you the dream. He's got, you got to figure the dream out, okay? And so there's only one person who can do that, and that's Daniel. And so God is going to define his whole dealings with humanity, okay, and the events that are going to happen in the world all in the context of Babylon, all in the context of modern-day Iraq. Once again, something else happened in Iraq where it all began. Nimrod began to set up a satanic worship after the flood in Iraq. It's in northern Iraq, and it's in an area called Nineveh. And also today, Mount Nimrut, which is a, which is a monument that was all part of that worship which represents every one of the major gods and deities worshipped by men for more than a, for probably close, well at least 4,000 years. It, that is going to come alive again right here in southern Turkey, not too far from where a lot of the, of the problems and conflict is going on right now. Um, all of this area will once again become a center of worship. Revelation chapter 17 is all about that. God's going to define all the rest of his workings and all of his dealings with men. And especially at the centerpiece Israel. All in the context of the Babylonian Empire. And, and so let me say one other thing. Um, all the definition of the Syrian, which is the Old Testament terminology for the man of sin or the Antichrist, all finds its etymology, all finds its roots once again over here in this little city in northern Iraq called Nineveh, okay? It's there that ultimately this king called Sargon or Sennacherib rose up and God used him to chasten Israel because of their iniquity. And he took a hold of, of, of the tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel, the, which was the greatest expanse of the land holdings and power of Israel. And they were utterly dispersed throughout the earth. And yet God says in the last days, he's going to draw them back unto himself. And, the, and most of those people don't even know that they who they are okay they don't even know that they part of the 10 tribes and so there are a unique thing in scripture I'll go, I could go into that later if, if the Lord allows me to but I just really want you to see God is defining the whole interface look literally like this look at this this is the expanse of the world and he's going to define everything that's happening in last days events right around this one geographical location so that all of the earth, all of the earth, all of these nations literally are relating to one area and it's happening now. And no one would have ever guessed it would be that oil, that black gold that would cause this. And reality of it is, it's more than that because there's lots of oil here. 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 Lots of oil here. All up through here but for some reason we only interested in it right there think about it all the world's looking right now the ancient Assyrian is the is Nimrod to start with the ancient Assyrian that is manifested in the, the Gentile oppressor and it's going to become very important uh, 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 that what I'm saying here in just a few minutes is I help you to understand the symbolism. The Gentile oppressor, the oppressor, those who oppressed the, oppressed the anointed of God. The anointed of God in context of the Old Testament is singularly Israel. They carried the mantle of the kingdom of God. That was, uh, that was turned over to the church, which is made up of both the Jew and Gentile. Now, it's not the nation of Israel that carries the banner. It is the church that carries the banner of the kingdom of God, made up of Jew and Gentile. But Father has a promise 
that with, with Israel that is once again confirmed in the New Testament because Romans chapter 11 spends a lot of time with it. And I could give you other verses of scripture of where God brings Israel back unto himself. Now, there's another big thing that I want to get to tonight. I don't know if I'm going to be able to, but I would really like to talk a whole lot of, about what's going to happen here that Habakkuk uh, refers to and, My, and, and Micah refers to right here in this little area that you can't even see. You've got to have a magnifying glass in comparison. Look how little Israel is. It, that, 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 that little dot right there is Israel. And yet it's the biggest issue in the entire globe. What on earth is taking place? The word of God is being performed on a daily basis. And if people can get their eyes open because they refuse to have any more communion with demon spirits, suddenly they would not be under deception and immediately they would be able to see clearly what's going on. And then you'd be standing in a place screaming your, to the top of your lungs, listen, guys, wake up. You're, don't you see what you're interacting with? And this is where we want to bring you. We want to bring you to that kind of revelation, that kind of clarity, that kind of insight, that kind of freedom, okay? So let's go back and look at God defining all the events that are going to happen on the earth within the framework of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, what God showed you was what is what is going to surely come to pass in the last days. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, the crown, the head of gold that you've seen, it is you because you are so glorious and your kingdom so glorious that God has exalted you above all men and above all the beasts of the field and above all the things that his hands have made. This is Daniel, man, speaking by the Spirit of the Lord. Come on, man. It is so much fun to come under the influence of the Holy Ghost and speak by the Spirit of the Lord and make known those things things which are hidden and he says and so he says the Babylonian Empire was was really not as big as the Assyrian Empire which basically the Assyrian Empire uh, stretched out taking in southern Turkey coming down under Syria here um, and then you know back around over here uh, um you can't really see it where you're at. I, I need to bring some other acetate so you can really see this. And then the Babylonian Empire was even smaller, uh, extending not really too much past the border of Iran and not, not as much into Turkey and, um, and, then, maybe, and then down here into uh, Saudi Arabia just a little. But then what happens after the Babylonian Empire is there's this great expanse. It's called the Persian Empire or the Empire of the Medes and the Persians. That, it got huge. Then the Empire of the Medes and the Persians more represent a lot of the full capacity of what we're going to see in the Eighth Kingdom. And I'm going to talk to you about the Eighth Kingdom because up until this point in time, there have only been six kingdoms. And I want to reveal to you tonight the Seventh Kingdom and the Eighth Kingdom so you know what's going to happen politically, you know what's going to happen economically, you know what's going to happen geographically, you know what's going to happen spiritually and religiously. Okay, are you with me? Okay, so um, he says, now, he says, that the, the arms and chest of silver that you've seen, well, that is a kingdom that's inferior to yours that will come after you, um, and that is the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians, okay, which was a bigger in expanse. And then he saw a, a skirt and uh, loins of brass, and he said, that is the third kingdom that will come, and that kingdom is the kingdom of Greece. And, of course, you know when you read book of Daniel, Daniel, none of this is interpreted. It is plainly stated like this, okay? And then ultimately what we see is we discover in the symbolism of the uh, interface between the Medio persian Empire, which has become popular in movies lately, right, and the Grecian Empire, we see now the place of the origin where the Antichrist actually comes from because we see this he-goat that pushes against, with one horn, that pushes against this ram, and the horn is broken off. He conquers, okay, but the horn is broken off, and four horns come up later on. So, so the ram is crushed, the ram's horn is broken off by the he-goat. The he-goat, his horn is broken off without any conflict because Alexander died not in battle and not because of being defeated, okay? And uh, that horn is broken off. 
And then we see four horns come up where the little where that horn was. And then out of one of those horns come the little horn that makes the desolation abomination. By the time we get finished reading Daniel, we know exactly where the Antichrist comes from. We know exactly what he looks like. We know exactly what, uh, what kingdoms he pulls together with him to come in the first three and a half years, ultimately up against Jerusalem. And when he comes up to against Jerusalem to destroy Jerusalem and to kill Israel, to annihilate Israel, he goes in into um, the holies of holies and he makes the holies of holies desolate proclaiming that he himself is God and that he is to be worshipped. Now this is the symbolism now of Satan, of the dragon and he's coming in a, and he's being manifested as a governmental power. He's the ruler, the antichrist. But once again, Satan is always manifested in the context of these governmental powers. I want you to get this. And it's this moment in time that we see in the symbolism of Revelation, Revelation chapter 12 that the dragon opens up his mouth, pours out a flood to destroy Israel and to destroy the man-child. Okay, God's remnant at that moment in time. And what happens is the earth opens up its mouth to swallow up the flood. Well, we understand by interpretation now, because of what Daniel said, that that is because at that moment in time in the middle of the tribulation in three and a half years into the, 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 the tribulation, he hears rumors that the kings of the north are now going to make war with him. And so they're coming down to make war with him. So he turns and leads off his pursuit of Israel. The dragon turns and leads his pursuit of Israel and goes after those kingdoms. And it's this moment in time that he's promoted into the eighth kingdom. And it is at this moment in time that he begins to do exactly what Nebuchadnezzar did. He makes an image of himself and he commands everybody to fall down and worship him. And this is the eighth kingdom. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the eighth kingdom here in, a little, in, in just a, in a few minutes. But this is a moment in time that now we have the mark of the beast where you're ultimately stamped with the beast kingdom. This is now the moment in time where Satan is out, cast out of heaven. He's now seen in earth. This is now angels interfacing with men on another level. But remember, the angels, is, are, angels are already flying through the heavens with the everlasting gospel. There is an interaction going on with men and angels that make uh, Genesis chapter 6 look like nothing even started, okay? And we know what took place there. A, a giant race was produced. This makes look, the interaction of angels with men that caused God to destroy the, the earth with water in Genesis chapter 6 look like nothing, I'm telling you. It makes what was going on with Nimrod ultimately look like the very beginnings of this apostasy as it indeed was. It's going to a whole nother level. We need to be aware of that because the Lord says, oh, we should be alarmed. When the Lord says, will there be any faith when I, the Son of Man returns? That should alarm us. That alarms me. And so I get, I, I mean, like, I'm screaming. I'm, I'm doing more than saying the, con, the, 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 the Confederate has fallen. I'm doing more than saying, you know, uh, the, the nation has fallen. I'm saying, hey, Folks, Satan has taken over, you know. Let's wake up. And then when, when the Lord says to us, if those days had not been short, and then the, even the very elect would be deceived. I mean, I'm, I am the very elect. Okay, I don't know about you, but I am very special. I am the very elect. I hope that you become special too. And I hope you become very elect. And I hope you can become very serious about this. But that causes me to set up and take note and say, wait a minute. Things are getting so bad here. The apostasy, the deception. Deception comes at you in a way that you cannot predict. Okay? And even when somebody is skillful in what they do, you know, they can tell you, I'm going to checkmate you in three moves and I'm going to come at you through your queen's pawn right there. And there, what happens is because they're a master of the game and nothing you can do about it. They already set. Satan is all, all Lucifer, what do we call him? Lucifer, we call him Satan because these are names about what he does, okay? Uh, that's not who his real name is. His name, his, his, probably his real name is Azazel. And that is revealed in a, in a, in a very uh, um, um, uh, elusive and kind of veiled way in the scripture in Leviticus chapter uh, 16. It's, but that is, probably his, that is probably his name. But it, regardless, it doesn't mean his name should be blotted out anyways. And the Lord doesn't talk about him. And so, you know, I just mention him because it, the Lord allowed us to see. Okay? And so I'll, I'll just because, you know, we got to see him. I have 
freedom to go ahead and just emphasize to you the point that Satan's not his name. Okay? So here we are. And then the next very thing that we see happen is we see, uh, um, uh, we see Daniel go on to say, and the legs of iron that you saw. He began to describe the Roman Empire. And he described the Roman Empire and all these empires in the, the uh, book of Daniel had a, 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 a animal, a beast, a terrifying looking beast that represented them. And which really helps us then to be able to grab a hold of that, superimpose it on the book of Revelation. Because by the way, the book of Revelation, at, beginning at chapter 4, has no, really no New Testament terminology in it. It goes all the way back to Old Testament terminology. And it's almost just, you know, you read it in Hebrew and it's just... It right, belongs right in the Old Testament. And so, so many people, so many scholars saw that it was so plain that then they tried to discredit the book of Revelation and say, ah, book of Revelation was written before the church and it just got into the Apocrypha and now, you know, it ultimately got promoted into the canon. But then what happened is through textual criticism, through, um, arche through archaeology, um, it was proven beyond any doubt there, that there is no way to invalidate John's writings. The Gospel of John, I'm just busting everything up. The Gospel of John, first and second and third epistle of John, and the book of Revelation, they are the most concrete, upheld, textual pieces of literature belonging to the New Testament. Nobody can in any way debunk it or, 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 or overthrow it. Beautiful. God's make, making sure there's too much witness to it in history. There's too much witness to it in what we call extant manuscripts. Okay? So everybody with me? And then he says, so that was the Roman Empire. Okay? So we've got, we've got the Babylonian Empire, one kingdom. we got the... Um, uh, the Media Persian Empire, two kingdoms. Grecian Empire, third kingdom. Okay. Now we got the Roman Empire, fourth kingdom. And now we're going to talk about a fifth kingdom. Okay. But when we look at the book of Revelation, we have to understand the serpent or the dragon kingdom. And you know what the dragon kingdom? He wounded the head of Rahab, the dragon. Huh? Who was that? Egypt. Egypt begins the oppression of Israel. Okay, Egypt is the first, really. But now when we talk from the prophecy of, of and, and after Egypt, uh, there was Assyria. And so when we talk about, when we begin to talk from the framework of prophecy, we've got to bring all of these in. But when we talk from the framework of Dan the book of Daniel, we start with just the Babylonian Empire. Okay, so that's why you're going to get different counts. Sometimes you're going to get a count uh, of five, and other times you're going to get a count of uh, seven. Okay. And um, so just bear with me and, and, and then, you know, then you're going to get a count in totality the way that it is set up in the book of Revelation. You're going to get a count of eight kingdoms or eight nations, okay? Eight, eight great kingdoms that were oppressors of the nation of Israel. And then he says something about this last kingdom that is going to exist. This last kingdom is going to exist is the feet, okay? Now I want you to understand that kingdom has not arisen yet. Okay, because Nebuchadnezzar and what Paul, what Daniel saw in context of Nebuchadnezzar was in context also of what the nations were doing to Israel. So the last kingdom to oppress Israel was the Roman Empire. Okay, all of these nations. The one thing that you can do when you look at the Assyrian Empire, you look at the Babylonian Empire, you look at the Media Persian Empire, you look at the Grecian Empire, you look at the Roman Empire, they all have one thing in common. You know what that is? They had Jerusalem. They had Jerusalem. They coveted Jerusalem. <laughs> Satan, Satan covets God's stuff. Satan wants God's stuff, and you're God's stuff, and I'm God's stuff, and I know, how, I know how jealous he is, and I know how envious he is, and I know what a tyrant he is, and he can't have none of my stuff. Huh? And he tries to mess with my, my, my truck, and I said, Father, Satan can't mess with a truck you gave me. And, there, and so, Father, I immediately I'll step in and say, yeah, we're going to cover that. I mean, because, you know, I know I'm engaged in a battle. I'm not just engaged in it on a material basis, on a financial basis. I'm engaged in a bigger way, in a spiritual basis. And because I'm with him, he's with me. Because he's with me, I'm with him, right? And we've got to get that confidence, dear people. Now, when we look at this, this 
what we would say is the fifth kingdom. One, two, three, four, five. This fifth kingdom represents actually the eighth kingdom. Now, I know that there are some would argue that it's the seventh kingdom, okay? And that's fine too because there's overlap here. And I can understand it being the seventh kingdom, but I can show you. And if there's any place that I would have a little bit where they and I would be looking at you uh, right now would be on this issue. And I can hear his comments, as it were, you know what I'm saying. Uh, but I have evidence and proof that it is the eighth kingdom. Now, there's something unique about this eighth kingdom, okay? It's made of clay and it's made of iron. And it has ten toes, okay? And those ten toes really are the same, and I can prove this to you, are the same as those ten uh, horns that represent um, ten kings, okay? Are you with me? Okay. Now, what's going to happen, what's most important about this, what's most revelatory about it is this. And, 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 and uh, Daniel said, And uh, uh, no king Nebuchadnezzar, whereas you saw a stone cut out without hands and cast into the, into the image and smote it in its feet, that it was then turned, that it, it then crumbled and, and, and was, uh, uh, became as dust, and the wind blew it away, and then the rock turned into exceeding great and high mountain that filled all the earth. He's telling you about his kingdom that will destroy all the kingdoms of men and how that his kingdom will rule and dominate forever and ever. Amen. Okay? So I understand that the, then that the, that the feet then of iron and clay have to be the kingdom. It has to be that the, the ruling force, the, the political entity, as it were, when Christ Jesus comes, the rock that's cut out without hands, and, be, and takes up his battle in, in Armageddon. Are you with me? Now, before he comes to Armageddon, Habakkuk says he comes gloriously from Teman. <laughs> he can, uh, Isaiah 63, 1 says, Who is this that comes from Bozrah with his garments dipped in blood? We're talking about various different places on the earth right now that are really nothing more than sand and rubble. But hold up. It wasn't long ago that Iraq was nothing but sand and rubble. It wasn't long ago. You see that little tip right there? You see that little teeny tip right there? that entrance in to the Persian Gulf that right there is Dubai Dubai is becoming the trade capital of the world it's already happening folks right there is Babylon right there is the place the seat of of Satan and you know what they did in Dubai go read about it they Hitler went to Pergama found the seat of Satan, moved it to Berlin because he wanted to get every uh, possible charm and everything that represented the occult to try to gather power on himself. Why? He had an angel of darkness ruling over him. That's how he was able to do what he did. He's not defined or revealed in Scripture other than he's just a part of the wars and rumors of wars and nations rising, rising against nation, okay? But the bottom line of it, listen to me, man. They went and they got the seat of Satan that... That Hitler moved from Pergamon and they moved it to Dubai. And that's not all they moved to Dubai. They've gone and gathered every one of these artifacts that represent the occult and they moved it into Dubai and they made it the financial capital of the world. Right now, China, the Middle East, all of the new economy is directed at banking right there. Forget about America. It's a blip on the map, man. It's a blip on the time scale of what's been happening. People say that New York is Babylon. Doesn't even come close to anything about prophecy. It wasn't there when Nebuchadnezzar had this revelation from God about how the governments of the world would come to an end under the authority of the invasion, invading armies of the kingdom of God. This is all right here. Never before could people even imagine it. A hundred years ago, you'd go, there's no way Babylon is always going to be a desolate wilderness. It's destroyed forever. It can never be inhabited again. It's been cursed. It will be, but it's not yet. And it's going to become a great empire. And this little teeny, that little teeny, <laughs> uh, point right there United Arab Emirate huh all the oil money all the banking all the OPEC money everybody's getting stock and shares in that go look at it it is wild it is wild 
it is a forerunner of what will happen right here that I'm going to read to you now in Revelation chapter 17. Okay? Here we are. Turn there with me. Revelation chapter 17. And we're going to le read here about spiritual Babylon. Behind the... When Satan took... When Satan was tempting Jesus and he took him up into a exceeding high mountain, he said, all the nations of the earth, all the kingdoms of the earth are mine. They were given to me. I have power to give it to whoever I want. Fall down and worship me. That's what it's all about. That's what we see in the book of Revelation in ultimate fulfillment. That's what we see. That's all that's been in the mind of Satan. That's in his mind at the beginning. It's in his mind today right now. He's on you right now with that. Get yourself into a place where you've got some insight. Quit diddle-dallying around. Come on, people. Wake up after so long a time as this. I mean, get yourself into the Word. Get yourself into prayer so that you can see that Satan has purpose to somehow entangle you with the lust of his flesh, the lust of of his eye, the pride of life. It is his craft that he uses. He wants to entangle you with strife and division and envy. He wants to, he wants to ultimately, he is the enemy of all relationship. Think about it. Don't give him any place. He's a tyrant. Look at what's going on. There's more people talking about the mark of the beast. I see people running around with the mark of the beast already on them, as it were. I see a satanic, uh, anywhere I see a demon activity, I'm a screaming, hollering. If you don't like it, you got yourself a problem because I'm saving you from an eternity without God. I'm helping you to understand there's too much place you've been given in your life to demon power. And it, I'm going to tell you, 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 it will ultimately take over because the craft and deception is great. Behind all these activities and governmental powers is demonic forces behind financial system is a satanic force that's just it he's prince power of the air god of this world spirit that now world works in his spirit uh, the children of disobedience so here we are we're looking at spiritual babylon okay revelation chapter 17 and there was one of the seven angels which had the seven bowls that came and talked to me saying to me come here and i'm going to show you the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters and all of this is going to be interpreted in this book. You not really don't have anything. There's only one kind of semi-abstract thing here in the end. And once again, if you have any questions, please email me I'm, or, or come talk with me. I'm happy to, to walk you through this. Because I, I'm obviously, once again, I'm just giving the general overview. There's a lot of details that I'm leaving out. And for the way, way my mind works, that's a, that's a big challenge for me to do. And, and with whom the kings of this earth, look at this, with whom the kings of this earth has committed fornication, spiritual fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. I'm going to tell you right now, wine always represents judgment. Wine always represents rebellion. Wine intoxication or, uh, of wine always re represents a, a, a demon power at work. And you just better believe it. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemies, having seven heads and ten horns. And I can begin to, I can begin to uh, list the names of blasphemies that actually exist in our age that are taken up in our mouth. Blasphemies that go back to ancient uh, Mount Nimrut that I was referring to. I'm not, not going to do that tonight. That's not my purpose. Um, but just wanted to point that out that there's a lot of more information to be had here. And having seven heads and ten horns. There they are again. Okay. And the woman was arrayed in purple. In other words, she's a queen. Okay. She's royal. Um, and, and some people refer to her as a queen of heaven. I don't really see it that way because what I see is the queen of heaven, Esther, Diana, um, the, the, the various different names of those, um, of those quote unquote goddesses. They are, just, they are just basically lieutenants in this particular framework of iniquity, if you would. Okay? And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Once again, I want you to understand there is chiefly nothing that represents the full-blown, unbearable, unmanageable 
iniquity like fornication is what God's wrath is ultimately focused at is fornication. He says, I will destroy that person in hell. That's the only thing he ever talks about that defiles the temple, especially the people of God. We understand that God said, I would not regard iniquity nor behold transgression in Israel. But as soon as Balaam, Balaam taught Balak, all you got to do is take some of those Moabite princesses, send them down there into Israel, get them to start committing any kind of sexual immorality. I'm telling you, the plague will be poured out upon them. God will turn his presence and protective grace from them. And he did. Okay? So we got to get that because look at how Satan has launched an attack on a level and on a scale that has never existed in the history of humanity. Where globally, worldwide, through the internet and through the television, more pornography, which is the actual word for fornication, the Greek word is porneo, which is also associated with, with uh, the word immorality, okay? I mean, look, people, it is the forefront of Satan's attack against God's people's life. Never ha every society that has ever crumbled, it always crumbled at the very beginning of its downfall was an unbridled immorality. I don't care. You name that nation. You name the kingdom. That was its downfall. It's written on the wall. Judgment's written on the wall. The end of our nation has come because we have opened up the floodgates. And I don't blame the world. I blame the church. We abdicated from our place of righteousness and holiness and purity and we, were, we ceased to be the one that stood against or hindered iniquity or lawlessness as Paul said it. It's the same word to say nomia. It's without, it means without law. And it's also as a word anomia in the Greek language is how what we translate iniquity. So we got, if we would not be ignorant concerning Satan's devices, we'd be stepping up here, man. Huh? We would engage in battle and we would we'd quit acting like that there's some place that we can have a license or a right to behave ourselves in modestly, indecently, or ungodly. Okay? So, you know, everybody wants to say that I'm old-fashioned and throw back some kind of a weird kind of prophet kind of guy. No, I'm not. I'm just a basic, everyday, ordinary preacher. Just preach, anointed to preach the gospel, to declare what God said in his word, not to add to it, not to take from it, but to say, this is what we got to do. This is what God says. He doesn't say it just one time, two times, three times, four times. I'm not emphasizing minor points. He says it over and over again. It's what the whole book is about from Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, all the way to Revelation chapter 22, verse 21. It's the subject. God ultimately getting every bit of sin and iniquity out of his earth and having only righteousness and holiness forever. That's it. Okay? Godliness and purity. That's it. I know the perfect will of the Father. I'm here to tell you tonight the perfect will of God for your life. Amen. I'm here to tell you the good, per, good will of God for your life and acceptable will of God for your life. All of it. The good, the, the acceptable, and the perfect. Or however way you want it's acceptable, good, and perfect, or perfect, good, and acceptable. Whole matrix. It all works. It's the same thing. There's not a good and acceptable and a perfect in three different categories of God's will. It's God's will is God's will. It's one will manifested in Jesus Christ. It's good, acceptable, and perfect. Amen? Amen. That's our reasonable uh, service. Amen? Amen? We live holy. Amen? We present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. It's our reasonable service. That's God's ex good, good, acceptable, and perfect will. Okay? <laughs> I've run out of time, and I haven't got the good part yet. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to talk faster. And upon her head was the name written, Mystery Babylon. What does that mean? Spiritual Babylon. That means this is what's behind the scene. All you can see is ships going to and fro, investments happening, uh, people making money. All you can see is all the merchants of the world getting rich. All you can see is grandiose prosperity and a blessing to all. But what's behind it is the spiritual wickedness and a plot to destroy the souls of men. And now you can begin to understand a little bit more perfectly Matthew chapter 6. Okay? So, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. She's the mother of these blasphemies. She's the mother of these deities and these goddesses. She's the mother of it, okay? She's the mother of it. There's something that happened way back here from which 
all and every deity and every idol worship and every satanic practice emerged into the earth that we have right now and has a gigantic impact in modern times that they had that devils haven't changed angels of darkness haven't changed they're just wearing different clothes and talking more elegant elegant language more sophisticated terminology huh so and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. And she's been drunken for a long time because she's riding on a beast that has seven heads. Okay? And when we begin to calculate those seven heads, we can start with the seventh kingdom. Okay? The seventh kingdom is the first kingdom that emerges under the rule of the Antichrist, which takes place in the first three and a half years of the tribulation. The eighth kingdom doesn't start until the last three and a half years, which is the beast kingdom, which is when the Antichrist actually makes an image similar to what Nebuchadnezzar made when uh, Meshach, Reshach, and Abednego got thrown in the fiery furnace. Okay, why did they get thrown in the fiery furnace? Because they wouldn't worship the image that Nebuchadnezzar made it himself. He wanted all the world to worship him. Antichrist is going to do the same thing, but he's going to have a bit more power because Satan, not just an angel, not just any angel, not just any common ordinary angel, although he will have a common ordinary angel, a powerful angel, the same angel that ruled over Alexander the Great, that gave Alexander the Great his power, will rule over the Antichrist and give him his power. And I can prove it by many verses, and I'm going to show you one verse of Scripture that begins to allow the proofs to be established here tonight before I stop. Literally. But ultimately, Satan himself is going to be cast out of heaven. He's going to stand along, alongside of the Antichrist who is who up until that point personified him. And at this moment in time, there is actually a changing of the guard and a shifting of who has the limelight. Satan literally takes on the limelight in the eighth kingdom. Because he's cast out of heaven, he's revealed in the earth. He comes right out. And he's being seen and who, for who he is. And he wants all men to fall down and worship him and take his mark in their forehand. Revelation chapter 14. So, and this is what's behind the seventh kingdom. And this is what's ultimately behind what's a lot of what we see in the formation. Right now we see the formation of the seventh kingdom. We see the formation of what's going to go down here in Mystery Babylon. It's right there. The hint of it's right there in Dubois. It's not only in Dubai. It's in New York. It's not only in New York. It's in London. It's not only in London. It's in Switzerland. It's, in the, it's expressed in a many diverse way throughout the nations of the earth today that ultimately will coalesce and have its full expression in a united anti-God kingdom just like Rome was a united anti-God kingdom just like Greece was a, a united anti-God kingdom anti-God kingdom, just like Babylon was a united anti-God kingdom, just like Assyria was a united anti-God kingdom, just like Egypt was a united anti-God kingdom. And we can, you know, you can even prove from secular history that Egypt got their gods from, uh, from Nineveh, from Assyria, from, from Nimrod's rebellion. And we can understand that, uh, that Nimrod was, well, I'm not going to go into that right now. Of who he was. Because I don't blow everybody's mind. Okay. And I saw the woman drunken on the blood of the saints. So we know what once again. We watch as these kingdoms have destroyed Israel. Have, have tried to ultimately um, gen create genocide in Israel. Slaughtered them. Syria slaughtered Egypt. Egypt oppressed them and made slaves out of them and killed the children, slaughtered them. The Assyrians slaughtered them and dispersed what was left throughout the ends of the earth. Babylon slaughtered them and dispersed them and then ultimately a remnant was saved, a small remnant in Israel and then also a, a, a larger remnant in Babylon. Huh? Uh, Greece... Also, the Grecian Empire also had a persecution not fully expressed in Alexander the Great, but in his generals against Israel. Uh, uh, Anti-Semitism. You know, you, you hear people talk about the Illuminati and the Trilateral Association and, and these League of Just Men, the United Nations, and these worldwide bankers. That, that, that's just like a affront. That ain't even close. Really, all that is is anti-Semitic movement. 
Because ultimately, if you studied it all the way out, I studied it all the way out back in the 70s. And everywhere it led was just the Jews. They're the whole problem. Kill them. They're the financiers and they're causing the wars and on and on and on. They're the money, uh, they're the money makers and the money handlers that's manipulating our everyday life. And if we could get rid of them, we'd all live more prosperous and happy and, 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 and with less uh, upheaval in our lives. That's been going on. That's the blood she's drunk on. And that's ultimately what we see in Revelation chapter 12. He comes with the same kind of force and envy that was already expressed in the six kingdoms before him to attack and destroy Israel. Somebody said, where's the church? I'm in heaven. I'm having the marriage supper of the Lamb because I'm caught away. I'm not a part of what's going on in the tribulation. The only people that don't get, that are immune to the wrath of God, are not impacted by the wrath of God, are the 144,000 who receive a seal in their head that keeps them from being harmed by any of the plagues. They are protected from any of the, of the natural and spiritual uh, uh, cataclysmic events that take place. That's it. Everybody else has got a heap of trouble coming down on their head. Are you listening to me? Somebody said, can you get saved in tribulation? Absolutely. And that's why if you go back and look at the YouTubes, you can once again revisit all the things that I said about the book of Revelation in the proofs of these, uh, uh, this up to this point, this point. And I've got many more proofs. But I show you three companies of saints uh, right at the very beginning under the first and second and third seal. You see first and foremost, you see those who are martyred uh, for their testimony in the tribulation. They can't stand before the sea of glass. God says you've got to stay under the altar. Your souls have to stay under the altar until the time of the end of the tribulation until all of your brethren who are going to be killed or martyred in like fashion as you are are killed so the only way in to the resurrection of the just is through a martyr's death during the tribulation there is nobody all you got to do is call upon the name of the Lord Jesus you'll be saved no you you call upon the name of the Lord Jesus you'll be saved but you won't be killed for being saved are you with me okay and then there is the, there is the company of 144,000 are seen and then there's the company that no man can number I remember tribe in every nation and uh, that have come out of great tribulation, and that's all the way back to Abel, okay? Unfortunately, Adam's not named in the, in the families of the redeemed. In the, in, the, in the chronology of the redeemed, Adam's not there. Somebody said, that's sad. It is sad, but it's not there. And that's why he said, my spirit should not always strive with the man, but he is but flesh. My, and it literally is, my spirit should not always strive with Adam, for he is but flesh, and the number of his years should be 120 years. Some people say, well, that's how God was talking to Noah. That's how many years it was left for on the earth for the time of Noah. But that doesn't add up. Go add, it, add up the numbers for the life of Noah, and when God said it does not add up. That's just a belief that we've had because, I, I don't remember, something, you know, uh, Lawrence of Sicily or somebody said that back in the 13th century and it sounded good and it stuck. I'm sorry, but that's the way a lot of doctrines are. The reality of it is, is God was talking to Adam who was but flesh and he said, I'm giving you 120 more years to get it. You know, and Adam basically hadn't got it by the time he was 800 and what was that? 820 or something like that, right? He still hadn't come clean with God. His son Abel did. Huh? Seth walked with God. But somehow Adam still carried the hurt. He carried the bitterness. He carried the deception. That's pretty radical, isn't it? Well, I'm going to leave that alone right now, but I just want you to, I, I'm, I'm trying to impact you. I'm trying to get you to wake up. I'm trying to get you to run, flee from the wrath that, that is to come. I'm trying to get you to run in terror from the devil and sin and everything that he's doing. I'm trying to get you to get over here in the ark of safety, get surrounded by the glory of heaven, get baptized in his presence because there's only one place of safekeeping. There's only one place of protection, and that is in Christ Jesus. Huh? The name of the Lord, huh? Christ Jesus, is a strong tower. The righteous run in and they are safe. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to stay safe. Amen. So, see, it's so hard for me to stay on topic. <laughs> and the angel said unto me, I get to go a little longer because they didn't get started till late. I got started on time, but you know what I'm saying. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore, dis why are you marveling? Why are you so surprised? Why are you shocked? I will tell you the mystery. Of this woman. Hey, here we go. Somebody's got to interpret. Here we go. Here's, why are you so shocked? Why are you, why are you so puzzled? I'll tell you what's going on here. Don't worry about it. He says, I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which hath the seven heads and the ten horns. Are you ready? Yeah. He says, the beast that you saw was, this is John's day. He was and is not. 
and she'll arise out of the bottomless pit. Now, you've got to have understanding because that sounds like a, a, a proverb, doesn't it? It is a proverb. He was. In other words, he existed before John's day. What, who, what, what kingdom was John in? Roman Empire kingdom. Okay? What was just before the Roman Empire? Grecian Empire. He was. Okay? And he is not, so he doesn't exist right now. And he's now in the, uh, in the bottomless pit, and he shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. What is he telling us about? He's telling us about the beast. He's telling, about us, uh, he's telling us about an angel of darkness that had special interest and special purpose to be associated almost pr proverbially, uh, or pr pr proverbially personify who this beast is. Okay? And by and large, this is why we say he's the angel that ruled over uh, Alexander the Great. But we know that he was also involved, and you could say he's involved in all the kingdoms. You say, somebody said, can you truly lock it down only the Grecian Empire? I can 90% lock it down the Grecian Empire. But I have a 10% total openness to also recognize that he was involved in the Media Persian Empire, which also had the occult and angelic help and believed that they were the sons of angels or the sons of deities. They believed they were sons of angels, of, of fallen angels. Zeus is a fallen angel, Okay. And they believed that they were sons of Zeus and, uh, and, and some of these other uh, blasphemies, okay? These other angels of darkness that manifested themselves, which Peter is the one who describes that these are the only ones that are in chains right now in hell. All the rest of them are free. The, they're, they're, they're in chains right now because what did they do? They left their place of habitation that God gave them to dwell and they came in and committed fornication with the daughters of men. Give me a break. What's going on? Where do I see evil going? Where do I see immorality going? Where do I see lust going? I see it going to the full manifestation. And I know it takes it, it, it little by little. It's just like, you know, heating a, you know, the frog up in a, in a pan, you know. And basically you, you just start with, uh, it starts just warm. And if you just go slow, ultimately it boils and doesn't even know. It never gets uncomfortable. Deception swallows you whole. Okay? So... The beast that you saw was and is not and, and, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and will go into perdition. And, sh and, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of life uh, from the foundation of the world. In other words, if, if your name doesn't appear there from the very time of the overthrow, okay? So there's the overthrow of the world, and from the overthrow of the world, names begin to appear in the book of life. The first one name appear in the book of life was Abel, okay? So Jesus says, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah. He says, he, says, he defines that um, concerning the, the ultimate roster, if you would, that's, in the, that's, in, that's named in the book of life, and describes that, the, that, the, the, that, the, that these things were spoken by the prophets from the foundation of the world, okay? And when you understand from Luke, when God says these things of God's mystery and these things of God's commands and purposes have been being declared by the prophets from the foundation of the world, that helps you to understand a little bit more about this whole meaning, the phrase. And literally in the Greek language, it means clearly to overthrow. So from the overthrow of the world. When did the overthrow happen? Satan says to Jesus, all the kingdoms of the world are mine. They were given to me. Who gave them to him? Adam. He capitulated his power. That's the overthrow. Are you with me? Okay, so from that time, men's names have been written in the book of life. And so the Lord's saying that ultimately here is the territory or the region in which Satan can operate. He's able to operate among all of those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. So, the, so and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the overthrow of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is and now I know some people will argue and say yeah but it seems to me that this is ultimately placing the those who exist at the time of the tribulation that are interfacing at that moment in time with respect to those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life from the overthrow of the world I've got a lot of things to say about that to help you understand it thoroughly you got to give me an hour and I don't have that right now. So we're going to move right on, okay? So 
Once again, he says it again, and, and he says, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And there is the mind, and here's the mind that hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. These are, and so look at this, seven mountains. Somebody say, oh, that's Rome. No, these are seven kings. Mountains are always represented as kingdoms. Once again, I saw a rock cut out without hands, cast in the image. The image crumbled, became dust, wind drove it away, and the stone became what? An exceedingly high mountain filled all the earth. Mountains represent kingdoms. So, you know, Jesus says, he gives the interpretation of parables. He said, you don't understand this um, parable? Then how should you understand all parables? And so what he does is he tells us, I'm going to give you the interpretation of this parable so that you can understand all parables. God is very consistent with the symbolism. All we need to do is give ourselves to the study of it, and then we have wisdom. We understand these things, okay? And we don't get off on some kind of, you know, crazy notion about, oh, well, he's talking about the Catholic Church. You're not talking about the Catholic Church. Okay, are you with me? These seven mountains are seven kings. In other words, what are we, what are we saying? These seven heads, right? Or these seven... Um, the, these seven heads are seven kings... Now, look at this. Look at this. With me? Five are fallen. Yes. Are you with me? See that? Yes. Five are fallen. Tell me what they are. Five are fallen. Five don't exist. By the, day of, by the day of John, five don't exist. Rome exists in the day of John. So let's back calculate. Okay, five are fallen. So then we're going to have to go Greece, right? We're going to have to go Media Persia, Babylon, Assyria, Egypt. Five are fallen. And it all began. There was no persecution of Israel until the days of Egypt because Israel didn't exist until the days of Egypt. And they never got oppressed. And they, and they were actually born in the fires of that oppression in Egypt. And that is where God first talks about destroying and wounding the head of the dragon. And he relates all that he says about Leviathan to that event. Okay? So... We don't have to interpret nothing. We just have to know some ancient history. And you don't even have to know ancient history from a secular uh, classroom. You can go back to Daniel and read and learn this whole ancient history. All the ancient history that you need to know to interpret and understand very clearly the symbolism and the meaning of five or fallen is all found in the book of Daniel. Now, I know that uh, Doc Stu is going to do a study in, in uh, the book of Daniel. And a not too distant future. So um, I, he talked to, me, talked to me about it the other day, and I said, "Well, let's just wait till November. Start in November because we got so much going on in October, and I don't know what day he's going to do it on. But I'm going to tell you that it would be a class that you would want to attend. Okay? So five are fallen. Where are we at now? Um, I'm in verse ten. I'm verse. Where am I at? I'm verse eleven. Ten. Coming in this book. Okay. Now, and there are seven kings. Five are fallen. One is, what was there in the day of, of John? Huh? Rome. And the other is yet to come. So he's riding on a beast that ultimately represents the satanic power that is operating behind the kingdoms of darkness, okay? And, or the heads are. The heads are carried on a beast that represents the power of darkness behind these kingdoms. And upon the beast is another spiritual manifestation of that which is behind the workings of all of these kingdoms and ultimately are focused on the annihilation of the nation of Israel. Okay? Because that's the terminology for saints here. I know we want to make saints just Christian saints, New Testament saints, but I'm going to tell you, uh, the Old Testament has Israel, God's people, the saints. Any saints are God's people um, Anyways, and somebody said to me about saints, they said, if there's no, if we're not going to go through the tribulation, if we're being caught away, then where do the saints come from? I said, how long does it take to become saint? How long does it take to become a saint? And instantly, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, you call upon the name of the Lord, you're born again, you're immediately a saint. You're a holy one. Isn't that beautiful? If you understood the gift of God. I'm telling you people, I had the sweetest, most encouraging, most amazing sermon for Wednesday night. And, I, it, you know, it had to turn into a pretty big, harsh, uh, you know, some pretty strong rebukes because of the, of the powers of darkness that I was dealing with. And, you know, right after the meeting, on the next day, I saw the manifestation through 
various different people telling me things in the, in the emails I got and some of the things that were actually happening in people's lives, the, the, the force of that. But you know what? It ain't going to overrun us. You know why? Because I am set against it and I'm going to advance the kingdom of God. I so love the anointing. If I feel anything that's not the presence of the Lord, I am violently opposed to it. I'm going to run it off. I'm going to scream and holler. I'm going to get people out of every demonic influence that exists. I'm going to rebuke. That means you speak very loudly and strongly to something. Are you with me? Amen. Come on. I'm all cast out. I mean, that's a military action to throw down and destroy. I'm going to throw down and destroy. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Okay. I, I'm, almost, I'm almost where we can stop here. So I better, by way, just by way of testimony anyway. So, and, and he says, one is, one is, and the other is yet to come. And will, when he comes, he must continue a short space, three and a half years. Three and a half years. This is the, this is the, uh, this is the seventh kingdom. It was going to be three and a half years Antichrist reign. Really, because in the eighth, the eighth kingdom steps in. The Antichrist is still involved. Antichrist is still involved. But now the attention to, turns to the full manifestation of Satan, Lucifer himself. That's the eighth kingdom. That's the beast kingdom. That he makes an image of himself. Okay, now, does the Antichrist make an image of himself or does Satan make an image of himself? That's up for grabs. It's up for grabs. A lot of Bible teachers say the Antichrist makes an image of himself like Nebuchadnezzar. I'm not so sure. I know in chapter 14, Satan has come down and he wants everybody to worship him and receive his mark. And I don't think he's veiled anymore. So it's worth considering, okay? And at any rate, I'd love to have Dake here in the meeting tonight. <laughs> you know, because I believe that he would be going. I believe he would be. I, be, I, I believe he'd be running through all the verses of Scripture. You know, like I've been taught to by the Holy Ghost. Do, 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 and go. <laughs> and I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't say that to, you know, um, draw attention to myself. I just say it only from the perspective of there's so many things unveiled here. And why do we need to see them? So, so why, why do we need to see them? Because we don't want to be ignorant to say the devices. We want to understand exactly where we are in the timeline of God so that we can be fortified that much more with a defense against what he's doing because we know where it's going. When I see where the full-blown manifestation of this thing is, my goodness gracious, you're not pulling me into what looks innocent. It looks like, a, oh, it's not, you know, we can just ask the Lord to forgive us. Yeah, you can, but you don't know what it's going to do to your spirit. You don't know what Satan, what tentacle Satan can grab a hold of you and hold on to you with. I mean, I think about it. I'm alarmed when I think about in chapter 12 how he, how he drew through his craft, his power, his deceit, his tail, you know, the, that's what a dragon kills with, his tail. He drew through his violence. He drew through his anger, through his craft. You know, as it were, one third of the mighty angels who stood before God throughout time. What could he do to you and me? Man, I want no tentacles of Satan on me. I want him coming to have nothing in me, man. I want to find myself totally in Christ Jesus, kept by the power of God. I write unto young men, because ye strong, and you have defeated Satan at every point, because the word of God abides in you. The word of God isn't just something that's up for grabs, and you know, hey, you know, you ought to pay a little bit of attention to it. Man, it is everything. Is the authority the word has made flesh to save us, and the word is living, a spirit and life that also keeps us. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Kept by the power of God. A part of the power of God is the word of God, which cannot pass away, which is sharper than any two edged sword, living and powerful. Come on, man. I don't like people messing with the word. I used to be violent against it. If I heard false doctrine, I was violent. It was violent. I mean, I was violent because it's just the Lord had put this zeal in me and then he tempered the zeal with his love and his mercy okay so that you know I could 
I, I, I had praise God for the high ground of the word. And it's not like that, you know, anybody's going to have any special glasses around here. Or anybody's going to have any special intellect. It's just you giving yourself as a, as a newborn babe to desire the sincere, sincere milk of the word. It's just you just as, as a simple one. Father, I thank you that you've hidden it from the wise and the prudent. And you revealed it unto babes hungry and thirsty for the things of heaven. And Father just fills us up with the insight and the revelation of that wonderful realm. I myself can be sitting sometimes. I felt this morning I was a little tired and it's like, well, you know, I'm not going to get into the word. I got all these things to do and I'm just going to sit here and be lazy. You know, okay, basically that's what I was doing, whether I was processing it like that or not. You know, I knew I need to get in the word. But I'm just being lazy. I'm a little tired. You know, I got so many things going on. And then I just got myself up. You know why? Because I know I can recognize myself. I've gotten smart enough to recognize myself. I got myself up and I pushed that nonsense aside that says I'm going to sit here and be lazy, huh? And I, you know, and I'm just going to stare at the wall and, you know, and whatever, stare at the bowl of cereal or whatever. I got myself up. I walked over to the sequential events and I started reading the sequential events. I got one page, got hit with something powerful, walked over to my computer because I wanted to check on a particular phrase to make sure that it was actually in the Byzantine text. Then when I got over there, I got hit with something else. And then I wrote what I wrote on Facebook. I got hit with that. Did you read that? I'm taking your filthy garments away from you. Take off his filthy garments. I take now your iniquity from you. Man, I just went after it. So you can read it on Facebook. Huh? Then an hour and a half later, I was walking around in the glory. But I could have missed all of that. I could have missed the maturity that's there. I could have missed the growth that was there. I could have missed the fellowship was there. Would I have been not walking with God? No, I'm full of God, man. I would have just been lazy. You know what I said? I would just I would have missed an opportunity of fellowship, of insight, of revelation, of opportunity. Come on, people. There's far more going on in the realms of heaven than there are going on in the realms of the earth. There's far much, much, uh, uh, far better things going on in the kingdom of God than there are in, in the kingdom of Satan. And 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 that's really one of the things I love about the book of Revelation. It unfolds and makes known this filthy, nasty realm that so many people think is so good and wonderful and it's all disguised to be something that we should seek after or desire. Okay? The ten horns which you saw, they are ten kings which have received no kingdom as of yet. Aha! We're getting this, aren't we? And then you have to work hard for it. Didn't have to fast, didn't have to pray. It just... It's spoon fed to us. We understand then that one of the heads, the seven heads, has ten horns upon the head. And that is a kingdom that's yet to come. It's the, first, the kingdom that will happen and exist for the first three and a half years. It's a seventh kingdom that will ultimately form into the eighth kingdom. It will be engulfed by the eighth kingdom. And that's why there's some representation of seventh and eighth kingdom that are they're, 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 they're almost like it's synonymous, okay? And I have to spend some more time with you in other verses of Scripture to help flesh that out. And they have received no kingdom as they yet, but received power as king for one hour with the beast. See that? See that? So they don't exist along. They, exi they don't exist with the beast. They're independent of the beast because what's going to happen? The beast kingdom is going to destroy them. Okay? These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called the chosen and faithful. And, of course, he says, he tells us what the water is. The waters are what? The waters are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. That's how Satan advanced his uh, agenda. That's how the powers of darkness manifest their presence, who they are, what's going on, what's hidden behind. The spiritual thing that's behind all that you see happening in kingdoms and nations is personified for us here. It's all manifested, though, through the very acts of nations, kingdoms, societies, sociologies, ideologies, the intellectual realms uh, that, that men exist in are expressions of this beast, of the harlot that's on the beast, drunk with the blood of saints, whose purpose is to destroy the anointing. 
to destroy the holy ones. And there's many different ways to look at it, but you have to first understand it in its first, in its, in, in its, in its first and foremost application. The interface of these kingdoms against Israel as a nation and how they, they, what they did to Israel. The church wasn't around in the, the, I mean, if people could just get this, there's more for me to say here, but I'm not going to keep you any longer. We'll, we'll take it up later. But if people could just step back and look at the very focus that is just seen right here in dealing with mystery or spiritual Babylon. Hey, you know, it, it really, the church was not impacted by Egypt. It was not impacted by Assyria or Babylon or Media, Persia or Greece or Rome. Israel was. Okay. And then to put the church into the context of, of the book of Revelation now with the seventh kingdom and the eighth kingdom is really a violation of, of the context, of the whole picture, and of, you know, the prophecies that unfolded, especially with respect to uh, the 70 weeks that were determined upon the nation of Israel that Daniel revealed, ultimately bringing us unto this end of, and, and not only giving us the 70 weeks, but also breaking them out into years, to years. And not only breaking them out into years, but breaking them out into months. And not only breaking them out into months, but breaking them out into the days. And somebody said to me, well, we're going to go through the tribulation. I don't care what you said. I said, okay, well, fine. If we're going to go through the tribulation, I can tell you the day and the hour that the Lord's going to come. Because it's the very day that the, that the, um, uh, the abomination that makes the temple desolate takes place. We know the total number of days to the coming of the Lord. So come on, give me a break. There is another coming of the Lord that you're not considering here. There's a moment in a twinkling of an eye where we're caught up to meet him in the, in the, in the, in the air. There's a moment, there's an event where the last trumpet sounds. It's the last trumpet before the book of Revelation begins to unfold. And he says, come up here. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. I show you a mystery. We should not all sleep. But we should be changed in a moment, a twinkling of an eye. There is no opportunity for that to happen anywhere in the, in the book of Revelation. I, I, you know, I just challenge any scholar, any theologian. I've done it many times. I'll continue to do it. Show me one place, one event. Uh, of the, that the most important event that is revealed in the New Testament would happen in the framework of the book of Revelation. It doesn't even exist. It's not even there. Huh? It was a revelation that was given to the Apostle Paul. Hallelujah. And was also given to another witness, John. Amen. Which also Peter referred to as well. Mm -hmm. Which also Jesus referred to as well. Okay. But was more clearly elucidated by both Paul and John. And so one of these days, <clears throat> um, I'm going to do a class that's focused probably for 12, week, 12 weeks on the catching away and the proofs in Scripture. Of the catching away. So that everybody's first in it. And any challenges and any conflicts and any confusion, I want to do, I want to take 12 weeks so that I can just spend some time just helping you walk through it. If there is any challenge, or if you feel that there is inconsistencies, or if you're not skilled enough in hearing it, you think, wait a minute, I hear you know something that doesn't make sense. Well, we can just take the time and flesh it out, okay? But what I really want you to walk away with here tonight is I want you to see the manifestation of the spiritual power that is at work behind governmental powers. I want you to understand fundamentally that when we're talking about Mystery Babylon, it is going to be fully manifested. This iniquity, this iniquity that has worked, that we see various different snapshots of it in the Bible and also in secular history, but especially as it re relates to Israel, will come to its full-blown manifestation. It, will can't, it can't get any worse. It is the, it is, it is the it is the greatest attempt to overthrow the power and the working of God in the earth.